Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to our first AP Environmental Science Flipped Video Notes of the Year. Today we're going to be covering topic 1.1, which is about ecosystems. Our objective for the day is to be able to explain how resource availability influences species interactions. We'll talk about predator and prey relationships. We'll talk about symbiosis, which is when two organisms from different species live in very close association with each other. Then we'll also talk about competition and resource partitioning or resource sharing. Our skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is describing an environmental concept. So before we get into the ways that organisms interact with each other, we need to cover ecosystem basics. So first we'll talk about an individual. An individual is just one single organism. Remember that an organism is a living thing. So in this case, we have one individual elk. When we use the term population, we're referring to a group of organisms that are all of the same species. So in this diagram, we have an elk herd. Very important that we distinguish they're all members of the same species. Then we have a community. A community is all the living organisms in a given area. So this includes the trees, the grass. We have a beaver, a rabbit. It even includes bacteria and fungi that live in the soil. So it's all of the living organisms in an area. Then we have the ecosystem. So the ecosystem is where we add in the non-living components as well. So these are things like rocks, soil, and water. They interact with the living things in the ecosystem. And so those two together, living and non-living, are all of the components when we're talking about an ecosystem. And then finally, our kind of big picture, thinking like a mountain point here, is that a biome is a large area that has a similar climate and that's going to ultimately determine the plants and animals that can live there. So for example, the tropical rainforest is an area that's very warm, has really high rainfall, and that's why we see such a wide variety of plant and animal species in the tropical rainforest. Now for today's focus, which is species or organism interactions. So this chart here is a helpful reminder for the outcome of the different types of interactions we'll talk about. So first we have competition. Competition is a lose-lose situation. So organisms are fighting over a shared resource like food or shelter, and this is going to limit their population size because there just aren't enough resources to go around. So it's a loss for both species involved. Next, we have predation. Predation is when one organism uses another as its food source or as its energy source. This is going to be a positive for the first species, but it's going to be a negative for the second species because that species will either die or be severely harmed by that use of energy. Then we have mutualism. Mutualism is a relationship that is beneficial for both species. So it's a win-win, and a great example that we'll talk about later is the coral reef, where we have little tiny animals called coral, and they interact with photosynthetic algae to form the coral reef ecosystem. And then finally, we have commensalism. Commensalism is kind of like what I like to refer to as a free rider. So in a commensalist relationship, we have one species that's benefiting and one species that really isn't affected. So a great example is birds making their nests in trees. The birds don't really damage the tree, they don't really hurt the tree, but they also don't benefit the tree at all. And so we call that relationship commensalism. Now I'll talk about predation. So the first thing I wanna point out is that technically herbivores, so animals that eat plants, are practicing predation. We may not think of a giraffe eating a tree, or eating the leaves of a tree as a form of predation. We may not think of a giraffe as a predator, uh, but in a strict sense of what the term predation means, the giraffe uses the tree for energy. And so herbivory or the act of an animal eating a plant is still considered predation. Then we have the true predators. These are the carnivores. So things like the leopard or the lion that are going to eat the giraffe. Now, this is what we think of when we think of predators and we call these true predators to distinguish them from the herbivores. Then we have a parasite. A parasite is still going to use another organism for energy, um, but it's usually much smaller than what we call the host organism, the organism that it often lives inside of or attaches to the outside of. And oftentimes the parasite will be able to draw energy from the host without killing it. Now we have an example here of the sea lamprey, which is sort of an eel-like organism that will attach itself to a fish and draw the blood out of the fish. We also have organisms like mosquitoes or tapeworms. And again, they're just gonna draw energy out of the organism and they don't necessarily kill the organism. Then we have a parasitoid. A parasitoid is a very specific type of parasite that's going to lay its eggs inside of the host organism. Then when the eggs hatch, the larvae or the young 
will eat their way out of the host organism. This often kills the host. And we have an example here of a parasitic wasp that's going to inject its eggs into this poor caterpillar. And then when those eggs hatch, they're gonna eat their way outside of the caterpillar and great energy source for the wasp. But unfortunately the caterpillar is going to die as a result of this interaction. Next we have symbiosis or a symbiotic relationship. I wanna point out here that the root terms in this phrase can tell us what it means. Sim means together, bio means living, and osis means condition or state of being. So it's a state of being where two species are living closely together. So we have a mountain icon here because we need to think like a mountain and remember that symbiosis isn't necessarily good or bad. It's just a long-term interaction between two organisms of different species. So it's not two squirrels living together. Those are members of the same species. It is two organisms of different species living in close association with one another for a long period of time. It can be mutualistic where both species benefit. It could be a commensalist relationship where one species benefits and the other is not impacted. But even parasites and their hosts are considered symbiotic relationships because they live in such close association for a long period of time. Now we'll focus on mutualism, which is a form of symbiosis that benefits both species. So both species are going to come away from this relationship better off than they would have been without it. And in many cases, they depend on each other to an extent that they couldn't really survive apart. Great example is the coral reef ecosystem. So coral are actually tiny animals. They are going to create the reef structure that algae rely on for a home. They're also going to provide carbon dioxide for the algae to do photosynthesis. And in return, the algae provides sugars via photosynthesis that the coral uses energy. So we can see here, we have these tiny little organisms called coral and an individual coral is actually called a polyp. And so they're going to live in the reef, but again, they're gonna produce that carbon dioxide that the algae need in order to do photosynthesis and the reef that they create is a home for the algae. So it's a great relationship for both and they really depend on each other. And we have another mutualistic relationship, which is actually such a close relationship that we consider the two species one single composite organism meaning they live so closely together that they function like one organism, and that's lichen. Lichen refers to a broad class of organisms where fungi live in very close proximity with algae, the algae providing the sugars or the energy that the fungi need, and the fungi providing the nutrients that the algae need in order to photosynthesize and grow. And so we can see here, again, it's these two organisms, a fungus and an algae, that live so closely together that they function basically as one single organism. And then finally, we have competition. So in competition, remember that it's going to be a lose-lose situation. Both species that are competing with each other are going to have fewer organisms survive, and so their populations are going to be smaller as a result. However, something called resource partitioning or resource sharing can allow these different species to utilize the same resource in slightly different ways, and that's going to reduce competition. I want to point out that the species don't get together and have a meeting about this. They don't strategize. It's just the idea that evolution favors traits that allow them to utilize the same resource, but in a slightly different way. There are three types of resource partitioning. We'll talk about examples of each here. So the first is called temporal partitioning. And this is where organisms or species that compete for a shared resource are going to use that resource at slightly different times to avoid direct competition. So here we have the wolf and the coyote. They're both going to hunt for small mammals, but they're gonna do so at different times of day so that they avoid directly competing for the same hunting territory. Then we have spatial partitioning. Spatial partitioning is using different areas of a shared resource. So we have an example of two different grasses here. One can send its roots to an extremely deep portion of the soil, while the other can access shallower parts of the soil, and they're not gonna compete directly for water and nutrients in the soil because of the different levels that their roots occupy. We have another example of spatial partitioning here where all of these different species of warbler will occupy slightly different portions of the same tree to make their nests and to find their food. And that's gonna allow so many more birds to occupy the same tree than if they all directly competed for the same exact space within that tree. And then finally, we have morphological partitioning. Now morphological partitioning is when species that hunt for the same resource will evolve slightly different body features in order to utilize different portions of that resource. So here we have a ferret and an ermine. They've evolved slightly different jaw sizes and slightly different tooth patterns, which enables them to hunt for different size prey 
And so they don't have to compete directly for the same exact resource. Again, the big takeaway here from resource partitioning is that it reduces competition. And so that enables species to thrive and grow to larger population sizes because they don't have to directly compete with each other for the same exact resource in the same place at the same time. Our practice FRQ for topic 1.1 today will cover the skill of describing an environmental concept and process. So I want you to look at this food web here and identify two organisms that would compete for a shared food resource. After you've identified them, describe how resource partitioning could reduce the competition between the two organisms that you identified. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future APES video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.